Section seven of Cousin Phyllis. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Elizabeth Clatt. Cousin Phyllis by Elizabeth Gaskell. Part four. Section one. When I went over on Easter Day, I heard the chapel gossips complimenting Cousin Holman on her daughter's blooming looks, quite forgetful of their sinister prophecies three months before. And I looked at Phyllis, and did not wonder at their words. I had not seen her since the day after Christmas Day. I had left the Hope Farm only a few hours after I had told her the news which had quickened her heart into renewed life and vigour. The remembrance of our conversation in the cow-house was vividly in my mind as I looked at her when her bright healthy appearance was remarked upon. As her eyes met mine, our mutual recollections flashed intelligence from one to another. She turned away, her colour heightening as she did so. She seemed to be shy of me for the first few hours after our meeting, and I felt rather vexed with her for her conscious avoidance of me after my long absence. I had stepped a little out of my usual line in telling her what I did, not that I had received any charge of secrecy, or given even the slightest promise to Holdsworth that I would not repeat his words. But I had an uneasy feeling sometimes when I thought of what I had done in the excitement of seeing Phyllis so ill, and in so much trouble. I meant to have told Holdsworth when I wrote next to him, but when I had my half-finished letter before me, I sat with my pen in my hand, hesitating. I had more scruple in revealing what I had found out or guessed out of Phyllis's secret than in repeating to her his spoken words. I did not think I had any right to say out to him what I believed, namely, that she loved him dearly, and had felt his absence even to the injury of her health. Yet to explain what I had done in telling her how he had spoken about her that last night, it would be necessary to give my reasons, so I had settled within myself to leave it alone. As she had told me she should like to hear all the details and fuller particulars and more explicit declarations first from him, so he should have the pleasure of extracting the delicious tender secret from her maidenly lips. I would not betray my guesses, my surmises, my all but certain knowledge of the state of her heart. I had received two letters from him after he had settled to his business. They were full of life and energy, but in each there had been a message to the family at the Hope Farm of more than common regard, and a slight but distinct mention of Phyllis herself, showing that she stood single and alone in his memory. These letters I had sent on to the minister, for he was sure to care for them, even supposing he had been unacquainted with their writer, because they were so clever, and so picturesquely worded, that they brought, as it were, a whiff of foreign atmosphere into his circumscribed life. I used to wonder what was the trade or business in which the minister would not have thriven, mentally, I mean, if it had so happened that he had been called into that state. He would have made a capital engineer, that I know, and he had a fancy for the sea, like many other land-locked men to whom the great deep is a mystery and a fascination. He read law-books with relish, and once, happening to borrow de Lolme on the British Constitution, or some such title, he talked about jurisprudence till he was far beyond my depth. But to return to Holdsworth's letters. When the minister sent them back, he also wrote out a list of questions suggested by their perusal, which I was to pass on in my answers to Holdsworth, until I thought of suggesting direct correspondence between the two. That was the state of things as regarded the absent one when I went to the farm for my Easter visit, and when I found Phyllis in that state of shy reserve towards me which I have named before. I thought she was ungrateful, for I was not quite sure if I had done wisely in having told her what I did. I had committed a fault, or a folly, perhaps, and all for her sake. And here was she less friends with me than she had even been before. This little estrangement only lasted a few hours. I think that as soon as she felt pretty sure of there being no recurrence, either by word, look, or allusion to the one subject that was predominant in her mind, she came back to her old sisterly ways with me. She had much to tell me of her own familiar interests, how Rover had been ill, and how anxious they had all of them been, and how, after some little discussion between her father and her, both equally grieved by the sufferings of the old dog, he had been remembered in the household prayers, and how he had begun to get better only the very next day, and then she would have led me into a conversation on the right hands of prayer, and on special providences, and I know not what. Only I jibbed like their old cart-horse, and refused to stir a step in that direction. Then we talked about the different broods of chickens, 
and she showed me the hens that were good mothers, and told me the characters of all the poultry with the utmost good faith. And in all good faith I listened, for I believe there was a good deal of truth in all she said. And then we strolled on into the wood beyond the ash-meadow, and both of us sought for early primroses, and in the fresh green crinkled leaves. She was not afraid of being alone with me after the first day. I never saw her so lovely, or so happy. I think she hardly knew why she was so happy all the time. I can see her now, standing under the budding branches of the grey trees, over which a tinge of green seemed to be deepening day after day, her sun-bonnet fallen back on her neck, her hands full of delicate wood-flowers, quite unconscious of my gaze, but intent on sweet mockery of some bird in a neighbouring bush or tree. She had the art of warbling, and replying to the notes of different birds, and knew their song, their habits and ways, more accurately than any one else I ever knew. She had often done it at my request the spring before, but this year she really gurgled and whistled and warbled just as they did, out of the very fullness and joy of her heart. She was more than ever the very apple of her father's eye. Her mother gave her both her own share of love and that of the dead child who had died in infancy. I have heard cousin Holman murmur, after a long dreamy look at Phyllis, and tell herself how like she was growing to Johnny, and soothe herself with plaintive inarticulate sounds, and many gentle shakes of the head, for the aching sense of loss she would never get over in this world. The old servants about the place had the dumb loyal attachment to the child of the land, common to most agricultural labourers, not often stirred into activity or expression. My cousin Phyllis was like a rose that had come to full bloom on the sunny side of a lonely house, sheltered from storms. I have read in some book of poetry, A maid whom there were none to praise, and very few to love. And somehow those lines always reminded me of Phyllis. Yet they were not true of her either. I never heard her praised, and out of her own household there were very few to love her. But though no one spoke out their approbation, she always did right in her parents' eyes, out of a natural simple goodness and wisdom. Holdsworth's name was never mentioned between us when we were alone, but I had sent on his letters to the minister, as I have said, and more than once he began to talk about our absent friend, when he was smoking his pipe after the day's work was done. Then Phyllis hung her head a little over her work, and listened in silence. "'I miss him more than I thought for. No offence to you, Paul. I said once his company was like dram-drinking. That was before I knew him, and perhaps I spoke in a spirit of judgment. To some men's minds everything presents itself strongly, and they speak accordingly, and so did he. And I thought in my vanity of censorship that his were not true and sober words. They would not have been if I had used them. But they were so to a man of his class of perceptions. I thought of the measure with which I had been meeting to him with Brother Robinson was here last Thursday, and he told me that a poor little quotation I was making from the Georgics savoured of vain babbling and profane heathenism. He went so far as to say that by learning other languages than our own, we were flying in the face of the Lord's purpose, when he had said, at the building of the Tower of Babel, that he would confound their languages so that they should not understand each other's speech. As Brother Robinson was to me, so was I to the quick wits, bright senses, and ready words of Holdsworth." The first little cloud upon my peace came in the shape of a letter from Canada, in which there were two or three sentences that troubled me more than they ought to have done, to judge merely from the words employed. It was this. I should feel dreary enough in this out-of-the-way place, if it were not for a friendship I have formed with a French-Canadian by the name of Ventador. He and his family are a great resource to me in the long evenings. I never heard such delicious vocal music as the voices of these little Ventador boys and girls in their part songs, and the foreign element retained in their characters and manner of living reminds me of some of the happiest days of my life. Lucille, the second daughter, is curiously like Phyllis Holman. In vain I said to myself that it was probably this likeness that made him take pleasure in the society of the Ventador family. In vain I told my anxious fancy that nothing could be more natural than this intimacy, and that there was no sign of its leading to any consequence that ought to disturb me. I had a presentiment, and I was disturbed, and I could not reason it away. I dare say my presentiment was rendered more persistent and keen by the doubts which would force themselves into my mind, as to whether I had done well in repeating Holdsworth's words to Phyllis. Her state of vivid happiness this summer was markedly different to the peaceful serenity of former days. If in my thoughtfulness at noticing this I caught her eye, 
She blushed and sparkled all over, guessing that I was remembering our joint secret. Her eyes fell before mine, as if she could hardly bear me to see the revelation of their bright glances. And yet I considered again, and comforted myself by the reflection that, if this change had been anything more than my silly fancy, her father or her mother would have perceived it. But they went on in tranquil unconsciousness and undisturbed peace. A change in my own life was quickly approaching. In the July of this year my occupation on the blank railway and its branches came to an end. The lines were completed, and I was to leave Blankshire, to return to Birmingham, where there was a niche already provided for me in my father's prosperous business. But before I left the North it was an understood thing amongst us all that I was to go and pay a visit of some weeks at the Hope Farm. My father was as much pleased at this plan as I was, and the dear family of cousins often spoke of things to be done, and sights to be shown me, during this visit. My want of wisdom in having told that thing, under such ambiguous words I concealed the injudicious confidence I had made to Phyllis, was the only drawback to my anticipations of pleasure. The ways of life were too simple at the Hope Farm for my coming to them to make the slightest disturbance. I knew my room like the son of the house. I knew the regular course of their days, and that I was expected to fall into it like one of the family. Deep summer peace brooded over the place. The warm golden air was filled with the murmur of insects near at hand, the more distant sound of voices out in the fields, the clear, far-away rumble of carts over the stone-paved lanes miles away. The heat was too great for the birds to be singing. Only now and then one might hear the wood-pigeons in the trees beyond the ash-field. The cattle stood knee-deep in the pond, flicking their tails about to keep off the flies. The minister stood in the hay-field without hat or cravat, coat or waistcoat, panting and smiling. Phyllis had been leading the row of farm-servants, turning the swathes of fragrant hay with measured movement. She went to the end, to the hedge, and then, throwing down her rake, she came to me with her free sisterly welcome. "'Go, Paul,' said the minister. "'We need all hands to make use of the sunshine to-day. Whatever thine hand findeth to do, do it with all thy might. It will be a healthy change of work for thee, lad, and a find best rest and change of work.' So off I went, a willing labourer, following Phyllis's lead. It was the primitive distinction of rank. The boy who frightened the sparrows off the fruit was the last in our rear. We did not leave off till the red sun was gone down behind the fir-trees bordering the common. Then we went home to supper, prayers, to bed. Some bird singing far into the night as I heard it through my open window, and the poultry beginning their clatter and cackle in the earliest morning. I carried what luggage I immediately needed with me from my lodgings, and the rest was to be sent by the carrier. He brought it to the farm betimes that morning, and along with it he brought a letter or two that had arrived since I had left. I was talking to Cousin Holman, about my mother's ways of making bread, I remember. Cousin Holman was questioning me and had got me far beyond my depth, in the house-place when the letters were brought in by one of the men, and I had to pay the carrier for his trouble before I could look at them. A bill— a Canadian letter. What instinct made me so thankful that I was alone with my dear unobservant cousin? What made me hurry them away into my coat-pocket? I do not know. I felt strange and sick, and made irrelevant answers, I am afraid. Then I went to my room ostensibly to carry up my boxes. I sat on the side of my bed and opened my letter from Holdsworth. It seemed to me as if I had read its contents before, and knew exactly what he had got to say. I knew he was going to be married to Lucille Ventador, nay, that he was married, for this was the 5th of July, and he wrote word that his marriage was fixed to take place on the 29th of June. I knew all the reasons he gave, all the raptures he went into. I held the letter loosely in my hands and looked into vacancy, yet I saw the chaffinch's nest on the lichen-covered trunk of an old apple-tree opposite my window, and saw the mother-bird come fluttering in to feed her brood. And yet I did not see it, although it seemed to me afterwards as if I could have drawn every fibre, every feather. I was stirred up to action by the merry sound of voices and the clamp of rustic feet coming home for the midday meal. I knew I must go down to dinner. I knew, too, that I must tell Phyllis, for in his happy egotism, his new-fangled foppery, Holdsworth had put in a P.S., saying that he should send wedding-cards to me and some other Hornby and Eltham acquaintances, 
and to his kind friends at Hope Farm. Phyllis had faded away to one among several kind friends. I don't know how I got through dinner that day. I remember forcing myself to eat and talking hard, but I also recollect the wondering look in the minister's eyes. He was not one to think evil without cause, but many a one would have taken me for drunk. As soon as I decently could I left the table, saying I would go out for a walk. At first I must have tried to stun reflection by rapid walking, for I had lost myself on the high moorlands far beyond the familiar gorse-covered common, before I was obliged for very weariness to slacken my pace. I kept wishing. Oh, how fervently wishing I had never committed that blunder, that the one little half-hour's indiscretion could be blotted out! Alternating with this was anger against Holdsworth. Unjust enough, I dare say. I suppose I stayed in that solitary place for a good hour or more, and then I turned homewards, resolving to get over the telling Phyllis at the first opportunity, but shrinking from the fulfilment of my resolution so much that when I came into the house and saw Phyllis, doors and windows open wide in the sultry weather, alone in the kitchen, I became quite sick with apprehension. She was standing by the dresser, cutting up a great household loaf into hunches of bread for the hungry labourers who might come in any minute, for the heavy thunder-clouds were overspreading the sky. She looked round as she heard my step. "'You should have been in the field helping with the hay,' said she in her calm, pleasant voice. I had heard her as I came near the house softly chanting some hymn-tune, and the peacefulness of that seemed to be brooding over her now. "'Perhaps I should. It looks as if it was going to rain.' "'Yes, there is thunder about. Mother has had to go to bed with one of her bad headaches. Now you are come in.' "'Phyllis,' said I, rushing at my subject and interrupting her, "'I went a long walk to think over a letter I had this morning, a letter from Canada. You don't know how it has grieved me.' I held it out to her as I spoke. Her colour changed a little, but it was more the reflection of my face, I think, than because she formed any definite idea from my words. Still she did not take the letter. I had to bid her to read it before she quite understood what I wished. She sat down rather suddenly as she received it into her hands, and spreading it on the dresser before her, she rested her forehead on the palms of her hands, her arms supported on the table, her figure a little averted, and her countenance thus shaded. I looked out of the open window. My heart was very heavy. How peaceful it all seemed in the farmyard! Peace and plenty! How still and deep was the silence of the house! Tick, tick went the unseen clock on the wide staircase. I had heard the rustle once when she turned over the page of thin paper. She must have read to the end. Yet she did not move or say a word, or even sigh. I kept on looking out of the window, my hands in my pockets. I wonder how long that time really was. It seemed to me interminable, unbearable. At length I looked round at her. She must have felt my look, for she changed her attitude with a quick, sharp movement and caught my eyes. "'Don't look so sorry, Paul,' she said. "'Don't, please, I can't bear it. There is nothing to be sorry for. I think not, at least. You have not done wrong, at any rate.' I felt that I groaned, but I don't think she heard me. "'And he? There's no wrong in his marrying, is there? I'm sure I hope he'll be happy.' Oh, how I hope it!" These last words were like a wail, but I believe she was afraid of breaking down, for she changed the key in which she spoke and hurried on. "'Lucille! That's our English Lucy, I suppose. Lucille Holdsworth. It's a pretty name, and I hope—I forget what I was going to say. Oh, it was this. Paul, I think we need never speak about this again. Only remember you are not to be sorry. You have not done wrong. You've been very, very kind. And if I see you looking grieved, I don't know what I might do. I might break down, you know." I think she was on the point of doing so then. But the dark storm came dashing down, and the thunder-cloud broke right above the house, as it seemed. Her mother, roused from sleep, called out for Phyllis. The men and women from the hayfield came running into shelter, drenched through. The minister followed, smiling, and not unpleasantly excited by the war of elements for by dint of hard work through the long summer's day, the greater part of the hay was safely housed in the barn in the field. Once or twice in the succeeding bustle I came across Phyllis, always busy, 
and as it seemed to me always doing the right thing. When I was alone in my own room at night I allowed myself to feel relieved, and to believe that the worst was over, and was not so very bad after all. But the succeeding days were very miserable. Sometimes I thought it must be my fancy that falsely represented Phyllis to me as strangely changed, for surely if this idea of mine was well founded, her parents, her father and mother, her own flesh and blood would have been the first to perceive it. Yet they went on in their household peace and content, if anything a little more cheerfully than usual, for the harvest of the first fruits, as the minister called it, had been more bounteous than usual, and there was plenty all around in which the humblest labourer was made to share. After the one thunderstorm came one or two lovely serene summer days, during which the hay was all carried, and then succeeded long soft rains filling the ears of corn, and causing the mown grass to spring afresh. The minister allowed himself a few more hours of relaxation and home enjoyment than usual during this wet spell. Hard earth-bound frost was his winter holiday, these wet days after the hay harvest his summer holiday. We sat with open windows, the fragrance and the freshness called out by the soft falling rain filling the house-place, while the quiet ceaseless patter among the leaves outside ought to have had the same lulling effect as all other gentle perpetual sounds, such as mill-wheels and bubbling springs, have on the nerves of happy people. But two of us were not happy. I was sure enough of myself for one. I was worse than sure. I was wretchedly anxious about Phyllis. Ever since that day of the thunderstorm there had been a new, sharp, discordant sound to me in her voice, a sort of jangle in her tone, and her restless eyes had no quietness in them, and her colour came and went without a cause that I could find out. The minister, happy in ignorance of what most concerned him, brought out his books, his learned volumes and classics. Whether he read and talked to Phyllis or to me I do not know, but feeling by instinct that she was not, could not be attending to the peaceful details, so strange and foreign to the turmoil in her heart, I forced myself to listen, and if possible to understand. "'Look here,' said the minister, tapping the old vellum-bound book he held. "'In the first Georgic he speaks of rolling and irrigation. A little further on he insists on choice of the best seed, and advises us to keep the drains clear. Again no Scotch farmer could give thruder advice than to cut light meadows while the dew is on even though it involve night-work. It is all living truth in these days." He began beating time with a ruler upon his knee, to some Latin lines he read aloud just then. I suppose the monotonous chant irritated Phyllis to some irregular energy, for I remember the quick knotting and breaking of the thread with which she was sewing. I never hear that snap repeated now, without suspecting some sting or stab troubling the heart of the worker. Cousin Holman, at her peaceful knitting, noticed the reason why Phyllis had so constantly to interrupt the progress of her seam. "'It is bad thread, I'm afraid,' she said in a gentle, sympathetic voice. But it was too much for Phyllis. "'The thread is bad. Everything is bad. I am so tired of it all!' And she put down her work and hastily left the room. I do not suppose that in all her life Phyllis had ever shown so much temper before. In many a family the tone, the manner would not have been noticed, but here it fell with a sharp surprise upon the sweet, calm atmosphere of home. The minister put down ruler and book, and pushed his spectacles up to his forehead. The mother looked distressed for a moment, and then smoothed her features and said in an explanatory tone, "'It's the weather, I think. Some people feel it different to others. It always brings on a headache with me.' She got up to follow her daughter but half-way to the door she thought better of it, and came back to her seat. Good mother! She hoped the better to conceal the unusual spirit of temper, by pretending not to take much notice of it. "'Go on, minister,' she said. "'It is very interesting what you are reading about, and when I don't quite understand it, I like the sound of your voice.' So he went on, but languidly and irregularly, and beat no more time with his ruler to any Latin lines. When the dusk came on, early that July night because of the cloudy sky, Phyllis came softly back, making as though nothing had happened. She took up her work, but it was too dark to do many stitches, and she dropped it soon. Then I saw how her hand stole into her mother's, and how this latter fondled it with quiet little caresses, while the minister, as fully aware as I was of this tender pantomime, 
went on talking in a happier tone of voice about things as uninteresting to him at the time, I very believe, as they were to me. And that is saying a good deal, and shows how much more real what was passing before him was, even to a farmer, than the agricultural customs of the ancients. I remember one thing more. An attack which Betty the servant made upon me one day as I came in through the kitchen where she was churning, and stopped to ask her for a drink of buttermilk. "'I say, cousin Paul,' she had adopted the family habit of addressing me as generally as cousin Paul, and always speaking of me in that form. "'Some things are missed with our Phyllis, and I reckon you've a good guess what it is. She's not one to take up with such as you.' Not complimentary, but that Betty never was, even to those for whom she felt the highest respect. "'But I'd as leave yon Holdsworth had never come near us. So there you've a bit of my mind.' and a very unsatisfactory bit it was. I did not know what to answer to the glimpse at the real state of the case implied in the shrewd woman's speech, so I tried to put her off by assuming surprise at her first assertion. A miss with Phyllis! I should like to know why you think anything is wrong with her. She looks as blooming as any one can do. Poor lad! You're but a big child, after all, and you've likely never heard of a fever flush. But you know better nor that, my fine fellow— so don't think for to put me off with blooms and blossoms and such like talk. What makes her walk about for hours and hours and nights when she used to be abed and asleep? I sleep next room to her, and hear her as plain as can be. What makes her come in panting and ready to drop into that chair? Nodding to one close to the door. And it's, oh, Betty, some water, please. That's the way she comes in now, when she used to come back as fresh and bright as she went out. If yon friend o' yours has played her faults, he's a deal for tanser for. She's a lass who's as sweet and as sound as a nut, and the very apple of her father's eye, and of her mother's too, only where her she ranks second to the minister. I'll have to look after yon chap, for I for one will stand no wrong to our Phyllis. What was I to do or to say? I wanted to justify Holdsworth, to keep Phyllis's secret, and to pacify the woman all in the same breath. I did not take the best course, I'm afraid. I don't believe Holdsworth ever spoke a word of—of of love to her in all his life. I'm sure he didn't. Ay, ay, but there's eyes, and there's hands, as well as tongues, and a man has two or one, and but one or the other. And she's so young. Do you suppose her parents would not have seen it? Well, if you ax me that, I'll say out boldly, no. They've called her the child so long. The child is always their name for her when they talk on her between themselves, as if never anybody else had a ewe lamb before them, that she's grown up to be a woman under their very eyes, and they look on her still as if she were in her long clothes. And you ne'er heard on a man fallen in love with a babby in long clothes? No, said I, half laughing. But she went on as grave as a judge. Ay, you see you'll laugh at the bare thought on it, and I'll be bound the minister, though he's not a laughing man, would have sniggled at the notion of falling in love with the child. Where's Oldsworth off to?' "'Canada,' said I shortly. "'Canada here, Canada there,' she replied testily. "'Tell me how far he's off, instead of giving me your gibberish. Is he a two days' journey away, or a three, or a week?' "'He's ever so far off, three weeks at the least,' cried I in despair. "'And he's either married or just going to be. So there!' I expected a fresh burst of anger. But no, the matter was too serious. Betty sat down and kept silence for a minute or two. She looked so miserable and downcast that I could not help going on, and taking her a little into my confidence. It is quite true what I said. I know he never spoke a word to her. I think he liked her, but it's all over now. The best thing we can do, the best and kindest for her, and I know you love her, Betty. I nursed her in my arms. I gave a little brother his last taste of earthly food," said Betty, putting her apron up to her eyes. "'Well, don't let us show her that we guess she is grieving. She'll get over it the sooner. Her father and mother don't even guess at it, and we must make as if we didn't. It's too late now to do anything else." "'I'll never let on. I know nought. I've known true love myself in my day. But I wish he'd been fired before he ever came near this house, with his please better this, and please better that, and drinking up our new milk as if he'd been a cat. 
I hate such beguiling ways. I thought it was as well to let her exhaust herself in abusing the absent Holdsworth. If it was shabby and treacherous in me, I came in for my punishment directly. It's a caution to a man how he goes about beguiling. Some men do it as easy and innocent as cooing doves. Don't you be none of em, my lad. Not that you've got the gifts to do it, either. You're no great shakes to look at, neither for figure nor yet for face, and it would need be a deaf adder to be taken in with your words, though there may be no great harm in em. A lad of nineteen or twenty is not flattered by such outspoken opinion, even from the oldest and ugliest of her sex, and I was only too glad to change the subject by my repeated injunctions to keep Phyllis's secret. The end of our conversation was this speech of hers. "'You great gorpus, for all you're called cousin of the minister. Many a one is cursed with fools for cousins. Do you think I can't see sense except through your spectacles? I give you leave to cut out my tongue and nail it up on the barn door for a caution to magpies, if I let out on that poor wench, either to herself or any one else that is hers, as the Bible says. Now you've heard me speak scripture language, perhaps you'll be content, and leave me my kitchen to myself." During all these days, from the 5th of July to the 17th, I must have forgotten what Holdsworth had said about cards. And yet I think I could not have quite forgotten, but once having told Phyllis about his marriage, I must have looked upon the after-consequence of cards as of no importance. At any rate they came upon me as a surprise at last. The penny post-reform, as people call it, had come into operation a short time before, but the never-ending stream of notes and letters which seemed now to flow in upon most households had not yet begun its course, at least in those remote parts. There was a post-office at Hornby, and an old fellow who stowed away the few letters in any or all his pockets as it best suited him, was the letter-carrier to Heathbridge and the neighbourhood. I have often met him in the lanes thereabouts, and asked him for letters. Sometimes I have come upon him, sitting on the hedge-bank resting, and he has begged me to read him an address, too illegible for his spectacled eyes to decipher. When I used to inquire if he had anything for me, or for Holdsworth, he was not particular to whom he gave up the letters, so that he got rid of them somehow, and could set off homewards, he would say he thought that he had, for such was his invariable safe form of answer, and would fumble in his breast-pockets, waistcoat-pockets, breeches-pockets, and as a last resort in coat-tail-pockets, and at length tried to comfort me, if I looked disappointed, by telling me, "'Who had missed this time, but were sure to write to-morrow?' Who, representing an imaginary sweetheart. End of section 7